Hi, this is Abdul Bharatiya and we are at the end of 2020 and we are almost there with 2021. It has been a long year. Uh, we should call it a decade actually, not a year. Uh, and today we have with us Rob Hirschfeld, uh, CEO and co-founder of Rack, and he has a crystal ball in his hand and he's going to take a look in it, into it and tell us how things are going to look like in 2021. So Rob, the ball and the stage is all yours. But before we go there, I do want you to tell me or our audience, what is Rackin all about? I'd be happy to on, on that. Um, Rackin is a data center automation uh, system. We, we manage and help our customers automate their infrastructure, server, compute, cloud, virtual, in an infrastructure is code way. So we're able to literally help customers improve their process for all of their infrastructure, what we call a distributed infrastructure management platform. Um, and it really changes the way people look at, at how they run uh, data centers and infrastructure from the bare metal, uh, which we do very, very well, all the way up into their infrastructure as code workflows. So that's what Racken's all about. It, it is interesting from an industry perspective, um, you know, we, we're not seeing a lot of things that might tip over the current momentum. Um, around you know big players acquiring smaller players and the the big cloud providers getting bigger, um, there are some interesting government things that might be coming down, like changing the the rights and privacy issues. Um, so I don't think that that you know, huge shifts uh, from external regulation uh, changing the economics of the cloud is uh, off the table. Um, that would certainly have seismic implications on how everybody runs those things. But but short of that, I, I do predict um, ARM is finally going to see some, some sunshine. Um, it has really been coming a long way in 2020 and 2021 really promises uh, for ARM uh, based infrastructures to continue to see a lot of um, spotlight and, and growth, especially in this uh, little interesting technology called SmartNIC where we're bringing new supervisory patterns into hardware. Um, we got some teasers about that in 2020. Um, it's a big deal in Amazon's data centers. VMware is really investing heavily. NVIDIA is uh, making a lot of, of noise there. So uh, we, we really would expect to see um, SmartNICs mature. I don't think they're ready for prime time, but it's a technology that, that I know our customer base is already starting to evaluate and make plans for. Um, and that's going to drag around a lot of ARM capabilities also. Uh, those are those are big pieces. Um, I know we talk a lot about edge. I love to talk about edge, um, you know, and frame it really in as a distributed infrastructure story where edge and, and colo, enterprise and cloud um, all become sort of more homogenized. But that's not going to happen in 2021. I think we're still seeing people trying to scratch their head and figure this out. Um, and edge edge projects, as they're described, are really more operational technology and silos solving individual problems. It's not a bad thing. Uh, we're solving real, we're doing real work there. I don't think it's going to become an IT problem in 2021. Um, it's going to continue to draw a lot of uh, interest in people and VC investment and headlines and things like that. And I'm certain I will contribute to uh, creating buzz around edge, uh, even as I will tell you. Uh, here, it's going to be a multi-year journey. So Rob, with you, we can talk about so many different things. I also want to talk about what do you see from Edge's perspective, looking at a lot of uh, progress development that happened this year. Kubernetes is also becoming a very critical piece of Edge itself. And a lot of like, you know, Suze Rancher acquisition is also completed. So talk about from Edge's perspective, where do you see things will be in 2021? So. You know, I think we're still really struggling to define all the pieces and parts for the edge. Um, a big part of that is, you know, how we're going to do data and storage. You're right to mention Kubernetes, and, and there's a SUSE project called K3S that I think is really interesting about lightweight Kubernetes. Um, but we're still trying to figure a lot of these pieces out. So while I, I think we're going to continue to see some cloud technologies coming in, there's, a, there's a, still a lot of gaps about how we think about edge technologies and, and what they really should mean. Um, interestingly, along those notes, Docker, um, by changing their registry policies, has really created um, a, a lot of ripples 
in the market. And so if you want to think about edge and containerized technologies, I think we're actually going to see a lot of dynamics and shifts in the market for that. Um, maybe finally getting people to building their own container registries, um, which sounds super down in the weeds, but one of the holdups in all this stuff is actually how we distribute these images, uh, container images around in a secure, reliable way. Um, that has been a gap in, in how we build edge technologies. And I think that that's something that's going to get a lot of attention in the coming year to the benefit of people thinking seriously about how edge technologies will work. Looking at this recent outage that we experienced with AWS. Do you also see that the perception or the way everybody was rushing towards, you know, hyperscale providers, public cloud just run, will that change? Because, you know, uh, it's not just taking down one company, you took down 20 different companies. What if Teslas were using AWS as well? So do you think people will take into consideration or they'll like, hey, that's one glitch companies will fix it, let's move on. I, I really don't think it's gonna change the status quo. Um, anybody doing scale design really does need to be very careful about where their dependencies are and what they're, what they're assuming is going to work and, and how they build their infrastructure. And I keep hoping that that's gonna mean that we're gonna have smaller infrastructures and you know people are gonna build their own pieces and maintain their own, but that's not the trend lines that we see. Um, you know. The reality of that outage is that you know it occurred because they were scaling beyond a thousand servers as the front end of their infrastructure, um, and you know for a lot of people, the, Amazon's ability to deliver those types of scale uh, capabilities in the in the short term are incredibly attractive, and and handing off that type of thinking to to Amazon is exactly what they want to do. So the people who are already deciding to do that are going to continue to decide to do that. Uh, you know, my expectation is that as we get better and better at building these applications and consuming cloud app, cloud infrastructure, or what I would say is consuming infrastructure in a cloud way, then we're creating, we're decoupling Amazon to an extent. And so I, I think that people will look at alternatives, but they're going to do it because they're able to do it themselves and they have cost reasons or control reasons, or they want more choice. I, I don't think that this outage itself is enough to really change the course. I mean, there's boardroom conversations about it, I'm sure, but at the end of the day, I, I don't think an outage um, is more than what people assume would happen if they did it themselves. So yeah, that's true because what you know the hyper you know, skill providers have done is that I mean it's it's virtually impossible to quickly get up and build your business. Also, if you look at these technologies, you need so much in-house talent uh, to, to keep up with that. And it's not just to build the infrastructure, uh, it, it's also about you know having people and that's, you know. And also, if you look at CNCF landscape, there is so much there that it's just you know, not possible. So the pros and cons are there, but I think what will happen is that people who can do that will strike a balance. We will see more multi-cloud strategy, multi-cloud story going forward. Uh, most companies, you know, so. So one thing I would say about that, that that really is significant and I am starting to see some pushback on is depending your business on a whole bunch of SaaS providers is potentially exposing yourself to more risk. So. The idea here is that you might be all in on Amazon and happy to use Amazon as infrastructure, but if you start depending on a whole bunch of SaaS providers where your data is going through their service and you don't know how they've structured it, you are not actually protecting yourself. So I do see increasing wariness of companies that are doing their work, how broad of a blast radius they're creating by depending on a whole bunch of external services because those dominoes start falling over really quickly. So you might be well insulated from uh, you know, an Amazon failure in a service, but a service that you depend on that has a dependency you didn't even realize was in your system might not be as protected. And so you might be dealing with a fault from a secondary or tertiary failure and that's where I think people are going to start scratching their heads a little bit more. Um, but right now, we've really decimated the software industry, the run-your-own-software industry, in favor of all these SaaSes and services. And until that changes um, through outages and pricing, um, we're going to see a lot of impacts for that. 
you know, a classic example of this, right? Salesforce is buying Slack now. And so people who've been depending on Slack might be, you know, they should be scratching their head and saying, all right, what's our actual dependency and risk exposure for that type of a transition? Um, and so, you know, we see this as RackN. Uh, we are a software company. We sell software. Our customers manage it themselves. They're very careful to make sure that they can manage it themselves and we're not connecting to it or egressing in their networks and things like that. They see a lot of value there. Um, and it's an interesting conversation because we see what the audit process is for bringing a SaaS into your business. And those are not, you know, that's a hard thing. That's, I wouldn't, it's not pretty. One more thing is that, we had had this discussion earlier also this year about the golden age of open source uh, and all those things. How do you see 2021 going to look like for open source? Of course, um, how we use open source as we had this discussion last time also is different. You know, Amazon can release everything that is open source, which actually is good because, you know, as you mentioned, a lot of core components of EKS, which helps companies learn how XYZ is solving their problem. So that is the role that open source is, but we also have to understand that we have moved from the world of running everything on our local server versus you have to make it accessible to everything else. What does it mean for open source? How do you see open source will continue to grow in 2021? Yeah, our, our conversation was really um, saying, in my opinion, that we're out of a golden age of open source. Um, and it's easy for you know Microsoft's and Amazon's to open source technology that they are hosting and running for other people. That's really the only place we've seen open source companies really be successful. And I'm sure I just made people's heads explode, but it's much easier to be an open source company if you your primary revenue is from hosting or running the software for other people than helping them run it themselves. And, and I think that what we're seeing is that the cost to maintain open source capabilities and knowledge and use open source um, outside of a vendor ecosystem is very high. And companies don't have the time or the appetite um, or frankly, the, the desire for the risk to look at a purely open source um, infrastructure the way, the way they used to. Individuals might wanna pull pieces in. There's a ton of great open source software out there. But when you start actually building systems that have to work and run in production and you have to move quickly and make sure things are up, uh, it, you're going to pay a vendor and you're going to be going through through systems. Um, and so open source is nice. It, it's a great to have. But what we're seeing is people who want to get stuff done are more and more turning to uh, vendors who are going to be a participant in that. You know, Red Hat might make a, talk a lot about doing all this open source work and Red Hat has a lot of open source tech. At the end of the day, when you're a Red Hat customer, you're a Red Hat customer. You're not a open source customer. Um, as much as they want to market otherwise. Uh, and so, you know, that we need to be able to get things done. You need to have a partner. Uh, and until open source really is uh, delivering the partnership that people want, we're seeing people realize that they, they it's the business side and moving things quickly forward that's the primary. One more thing is that what is going to be the focus of REC and in 2021? So, we have a lot of interesting things coming in 2021. Um, we've, we've got a whole bunch of technology that we've been working on in pieces that are, have all come together as part of this core story around infrastructure as code. And I think what you'll see out of RackN is a real transformation from being about you know, bare metal data center automation into really embracing the core of our message, which has always been infrastructure as code, but in the last year, we've really extended that infrastructure as code to create infrastructure as code management capabilities where we can bring in other tools and capabilities and run them as part of a workflow. Our distributed infrastructure management actually takes autonomous sites and creates a federated control plane across clouds and bare metal and virtualization um, in really powerful ways, all driven by infrastructure as code. And so what we're really seeing is these pieces coming together in an incredibly powerful way um, where we're, we're actually able to create synergies between our customers and within our customers where they are taking advantage of infrastructure as code modules, which we've battle hardened, and then they take them into new scenarios. It's, it's been very exciting to watch. We're already doing this and we're gonna start talking about it a lot more in 2021.
Perfect. Uh, Rob, thank you so much for sharing your crystal ball with us and also uh, talk about the focus of uh, Reckon. Uh, because Reckon, you know, it's like a microchasm, you know, what is happening in the rest of the industry because they're big players, but, you know, the real story happens at the level where Reckon is, you know. So it's really interesting to see what you guys are planning. So once again, thank you. I'm pretty confident that we'll see each other again this year. If not, then Happy New Year and we'll see you next year. I'm looking forward to it as well. Thank you. Happy New Year.